uh, with that composer's name on it, be able to sustain past just this lecture recital. Um, so I came up with a list of composers that I wanted to reach out to, and I reached out to them. Most of them have websites already online that I could just go online, find recordings of previous work, um, and find contact information, so it's really easy to reach out. So I, and usually our correspondence would consist of me introducing myself to the composer, ask if the composer actually had any interest in writing for the euphonium. Obviously that's important, right? Um, as well as sending a link of my recent performances, so that not only lets the composer know what I'm capable of playing, but also what kinds of repertoires are available for us. Um, and then additionally, you want to ask for a ballpark idea on, on pricing. <clears throat> so speaking of pricing, another obviously hurdle for a project like this is the budget. So you know every facet that you take, or you know part of every facet of this project carries cost, whether that be monetary or obviously budgetary. So that's a challenge that you have to overcome as well. Um, now I don't really have a lot of time to delve into this, but the Funds for this project actually came from a successful Kickstarter campaign, and like I said, I don't really have time to go into what makes that successful that's worthy of its own lecture. However, suffice it to say, there are a number of intricacies that go into doing that, certainly. <clears throat> There's another risk as well, and that's not liking the pieces. So you could go through all this and then figure out you don't actually like the work. Um, now, I need to stress immediately right now, because we actually have composers in the room, that I do like the pieces, <laughs> thankfully. Um, but you know that is a, that is a challenge going in. What if you get a work and you don't like it? Um, once again, I'm, I'm very fortunate in, uh, in liking my pieces quite a bit. Um, but actually, I'd like to have a little audience participation if I can. So this is great. We've got almost a, or pretty much a full room in here. We're probably close to fire capacity. So I'd like to take a little little poll. Uh, and now I need to refer to my notes because I need to word this correctly. Do you feel that your performance of a piece changes if you like the piece or not? So raise your hand if you think, yes, absolutely, the performance of the work changes if you like the piece. Wow. That's quite a bit. OK, no? Who says no? One? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think it would be that bad. Um, so when I was initially asked this, this question, I you know, thought exactly like 99% you know, of you, absolutely it does. However, really, truthfully, the answer should be no. Um, and if you really think about it, it makes a lot of sense here. Because um, you, are, you are commissioning an artist. You are not playing your own work. It isn't about you. You're commissioning somebody else. In fact, I, I read this quote recently. A composer's music is his or her own biography or auto. So again, it's not about you as a performer. It's about playing with a composer book. So, in my view, that makes it to where, really, truthfully, no, it shouldn't happen. But let me stress again, I like the pieces. <laughs> so, and so because of this, it was very important for me to censor the composer as little as I could. Um, I already feel like I'm kind of boxing the composer in a corner enough by telling them that they have to write for the point. And so I didn't want to censor the composer any more than, I, any more than that unless they requested that I do so. So going into the uh, actual pieces now, first we are going to look at Sam Adler's A Euphonious Quartet. Uh, <clears throat> so why, why Sam Adler specifically? Well, there's the Eastman connection. So Dr. Adler was a uh, professor here and is still a professor in areas here at the Eastman School. So we had that connection immediately. Additionally, he had written for Euphonium before, which obviously appeals to me. He wrote a piece called uh, Dialogues for Euphonium and Marimba that actually a colleague of ours played here. Uh, a year or two ago, and I actually liked that piece quite a bit. Uh, <clears throat> so that was certainly motivation for me. Uh, additionally, he has a stellar national and international reputation for composition and uh, orchestration. <clears throat> so briefly about the work, the work is a pre-movement piece for euphonium and string trio, uh, violin, viola, and cello. There are actually several reflections <clears throat> of the past, despite obvious forward-thinking compositional style in this piece. Uh, also, the work features several points of dialogue between the euphonium and other instruments as well. Uh, and lastly, the harmonic and melodic structure is a result of some of serious intervallic composition. <clears throat> 
So, you know, one thing that's really unique about this project and about commissioning the works in general that I actually really appreciated throughout the process is that uh, performers and, and, and musicologists actually more often refer to this um, intentional fallacy, is what it's called, to where if you play a piece by Mozart or by Bach or by Beethoven or, or anybody else that's no longer with us, you think, well, what were they intending here, even though they might not have really been intending anything? Or, you know, you constantly think about what was going through the head when they write music. However, I don't really have that problem because I can just reach out to the composer. <laughs> so I don't have to deal with that, um, with, with that issue. Anyway, on that note, uh, Dr. Adler actually informed me that this piece was uh, influenced somewhat by Mozart's flute quartet in D major. Uh, and that's not to say that you will hear a lot of Mozart in the piece when we perform it in a couple of minutes. But there are some similarities here. <clears throat> uh, you can see that the orchestration is similar, so we're just swapping out one wind instrument for another. <clears throat> also, the movement structure is similar. Adler has a slow introduction to the work, but otherwise it's a fast, slow, fast movement structure. <clears throat> Additionally, both composers wrote ataka between the second and third movements, i.e. without pause or slight pause. Um, between the second and third movements, you can see that in both of the examples here. <clears throat> and so, after we get a kind of an ominous introduction of this work, the violin actually states a 12-tone row here. <clears throat> the euphonium then enters with another 12-tone row. However, you can see in the, uh, the first two measures here that there are actually 11 pitches. And we're missing an E natural. However, you can see that the cello then enters with an E natural. <clears throat> And so this is kind of our first example of what I previously mentioned as dialogue between the instruments. You have one instrument starting the 12-tone row and another instrument finishing. However, this incomplete statement kind of sparked my interest a little bit to where I wanted to reach out to the composer. Uh, and he actually mentioned that although the piece is 12-tone in nature, his focus is more on melodic intervals, which in turn help create more sonorous cadences throughout the, throughout the work. And so, oops. So this is the first cadence, and this is the first time when all four voices line up and play simultaneously together. <clears throat> and the intervals that are present in this cadence include whole step, half step, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, and minor third. And now if you look at the melody immediately before, we have the same melodic intervals that are present. So he uses these melodic intervals to then enter the cadence. <clears throat> So moving on to movement two, certain intervals are once again emphasized. We have the minor second or a half step and the major second, whole step, and the minor third are of particular importance throughout this movement. Additionally, the funny will be muted for an additional color change to the music as well. <coughs> and to further emphasize the importance of these intervals, we look at the end of the movement. Now this is the very end and it's just solely funny alone. So he's focusing on, mel on melody to emphasize the intervals. And if you look at the slur markings, we have major second, minor second, major second, and then we have a minor third to actually conclude the movement. So you can see the emphasis on these intervals. <clears throat> now in the final movement, <clears throat> we tend to focus a little bit more on the minor seconds and the major seconds. Uh, this is the beginning of the movement with the strings in unison playing together, repeating whole steps and half steps together in unison. So the intensity of this melody actually leads to a cadence, as you see here. And if you look at the actual notes that are in this cadence, it's full of half steps and whole steps. Like I mentioned before, in addition to the intervallic structure that's important in this movement, we also focus on intense dialogue between the voices. <clears throat> and you can see, the strings, in the very last measure there, the strings have the first three sixteenth notes, and the euphonium then enters on the fourth sixteenth note. <clears throat> so before we perform the work, I just want to point out another few interesting facts about this commission. Um, actually, at first, Dr. Adler told me that he actually wasn't interested in writing for euphonium. He actually just finished another solo euphonium work. So, you know, 
There's only so much euphonium you can take, I think, so. <laughs> <laughs> but he actually later admitted to me that he would be really interested in writing something if he could write it for a chamber group. Um, and so, you know, once again, in an effort not to censor the composer and what I'm doing here, um, and additionally upon further reflection of the fact that we don't have a lot of repertoire with the string trio, uh, I actually became really excited about this. And um, then the piece was born. So, <clears throat> throughout the process in every piece that, that you commission, there are some revisions that occur. Um, in this piece, I mean, there was one measure where the, where the cello, we just had to change some articulations. There are a couple measures where you have to take a little bit more time, just for, for playability's sake. And that happens in pretty much every new commission that you, that you work on. Um, <clears throat> so from a performance practice standpoint, especially in comparison to the work that we already have in our repertory, there were certainly some challenges of this piece. So for one thing, the orchestration. That's not something that, like I said, you find yourself a lot of that, where we don't have a lot of that. So that was certainly a challenge. And this affects the balance. So euphonium, as you can imagine, might tend to overpower strings. So that's something that you have to think about. Um, intonation, and, and you may think, you know, tuning is tuning, Evan, come on. But it's a little bit different when you're tuning instruments that you're not used to tuning to. Additionally, matching style, being able to match the pizzicato nature of the strings or the arco style of the strings is, is just a new challenge. 